neurosurgeon from Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston. And I'm Mike Wang. I'm a neurosurgeon who specializes in spine at the University of Miami. And I'm uh, Michael Dobbs. I'm at the uh, UNLV School of Medicine in Las Vegas, Nevada. So uh, we're here today, you guys, to talk a little bit about degenerative scoliosis. And I know both of you uh, treat a lot of this uh, and see a lot of these patients with these problems now. It seems like we're seeing more of it. I think you'd probably agree. But what I'd like to do is just talk about like a, a typical patient. Let's say they're 74 years old, um, have failed. Let's assume they failed uh, conservative measures or non-operative measures, have uh, stenosis typically, like three, four, four, five, and uh, have come to you for, for uh, evaluation. And, and they're basically uh, feel like they're at their wits end as far as non-operative care. So Charlie, why don't you tell me what you first think about in your evaluation with these patients? You know, they're complicated. They can be really young, 74-year-old. They can be old. Can you give some uh, your insights on that? Yeah, so I think you hit the nail on the head. You really need to understand the patient is not just about treating the scoliosis. So bone health is often an issue, so you make sure you, that that's optimized because you really depend on your implants frequently, and that can be a, a source of failure. Um, any medical issues, the obvious things are cardiovascular, but um, other people, diabetes is a big one. Make sure you optimize things that can be optimized. Uh, nutrition can sometimes be a big, big deal, and that's easily changed. So I think th those are the main things, and then you decide whether you're treating them primarily for stenosis and, and neurogenic claudication versus deformity-related pain. That's a, that's, those are all great points. So let's assume, okay, 74-year-old, let's say the curve's less than 30 degrees, Mike. Let's say it's 27 degrees, somewhere in there. And uh, let's, let's assume that they primarily have stenosis, so they have neurogenic claudication, but it's complicated by a degenerative curve. What, what, are, what are some of your insights in, in uh, treating that beyond what, what uh, Charles has talked about as far as you know, looking at all the comorbidities? Uh, what are the other things that you really look at in treating that patient? I mean, Michael, you're absolutely right. 74 can be young or 74 right. can be old. And frequently I'll see these people multiple times in the clinic, and I'll try to gauge where they are in their life path. So if someone is 74 and wants to ski and they want to do these things and they primarily have claudication, we're going to do a more limited type of operation. Other people are more happy to be sedentary and they have a lot of back pain, a lot of facet arthritis. I'll often order a SPECT scan, a nuclear medicine scan, look for hot spots. And you know their, their attitude towards surgery is important too. Um, there are certainly patients that are going to need a T10 to pelvis or a, a large fusion. I tend, however, to start small. And uh, unfortunately, that means that often I'll have to reoperate on people later on in life. But I think that we try to gauge the surgery to their needs at this time in life. I think that's a, that's a great point. Um, you know, we, we hear so much and we all give lectures on, on uh, treating it adequately and making sure everybody's balanced. But some people can get away with a little bit of imbalance, right? And without doing a T10 to pelvis. So, Charlie, what, what is your decision making on when you go big, let's say, or when you, when you go smaller, and then I'll get to Mike, who's our minimally invasive expert. Yeah, so I, I, it's like Mike said, you, you really just need to listen to the patient. And, and I think if, if their prevailing complaint is neurogenic claudication, that's what you have to treat. And if you respect certain structures, respect the midline, you know, just decompress the roots that need to be decompressed, Sometimes you'll need to do sort of a, just an isolated fusion just to prevent further slip, either lateral or, or spondylolisthesis. But, but you can do isolated fusions within the curve uh, along with your, your good foraminal decompressions and, and get them what they want. But I think if you really talk to the patient, you can tease out deformity-related pain, and those people need bigger operations, and especially if they're sagittally malaligned, yeah. that's, that they're going to have problems. Yeah, I agree. So I think it sounds like if we, if you have a, first of all, you're looking at the uh, pathology, stenosis, we know we have to take care of that, and then sort of the next step is, do you need to stabilize it or not, right? So do you, is it something you think you can get away with just a decompression, which would be great on most of these patients, but then when do you need to go to the next level? And Mike, since we're fortunate to have you as one of our minimally invasive experts, um, when, when do you, because you, you want to try to do a smaller operation, when, in degenerative scoliosis, what, what is the right patient for you to consider that, or maybe even an indirect approach that's becoming popular? Yeah, those are all really good points, and I would, I would uh, echo what, what Charlie said. 
Um, there's so many ways to look at it, right? So stenosis, is it central stenosis? Is it lateral recess stenosis? Is it top-down stenosis between the pedicles? Is it a dynamic stenosis that occurs only with standing? And these factors all play into whether or not we're going to do an open operation, maybe open with stabilization, big or, or short segment. And of course, you know, it's very popular now to do inner body, right? So a lateral inner body fusion to, to distract maybe the apex of the curve and treat dynamic stenosis where people are compressing top-down between the pedicles. Uh, some people do that standalone. Uh, some people like to do that with percutaneous screws or even an open posture operation. Um, I mean, there's so many good options. I think that in talking to the patient, you try to tease out, are they claudicating from the central stenosis, lateral recess uh, stenosis, a dynamic compression, or do they really need to have to have the curve lifted, right? Is, is that really the issue just to get the nerve open? So when, when would you consider just a decompression leave the curve where it's at and do an inside tube, we want to call that local fusion with instrumentation, meaning not trying to correct much, but just lock it in so that you stabilize them and let them get on with their life. What, are, what, what do you need to see to be able to, to, uh, to offer that a patient? So, uh, let me just say that I like that operation. I think that's a good operation. It usually means we're coming back, right? The patient's 74, they'll probably live, the average 74 year old probably has a life expectancy into the late uh, 80s, early 90s, right? Because they've already survived 74 years. Um, I think that that's a very robust operation as long as you're treating the focal pathology. Um, the other thing I'll add, though, is that there's a growing realm of endoscopic surgery, so a decompression without as much destabilization, and people are starting to explore just getting the foramina or the, uh, the central canal open without really disrupting as much of the facet joints. So I think that's something we're going to see a lot of in the future as well. Great. And Charlie, what about you? Um, what if you, is there a certain number of levels? Let's say you've decompressed three levels. Is that somebody you'd still consider not, not fusing? Uh, fusing in a degenerative curve that's we're saying again we're assuming this is less than 30 degrees yeah, so it, it depends where the pathology is so it, it, if it's you know if you can I, I like to preserve the midline I, I think that makes a difference and really if you can do isolated laminal foraminotomies you know you're, you're not just taking a whole continuous hemi laminectomy all the way up that's going to make a difference whether their disc spaces are already kind of fused or bridging osteophytes versus something more dynamic, that's going to make a difference. Whether you need to distract the, the foramen, if, if most of the, the compression is top down, um, that's going to make a difference. So I, I think the main thing is you, you, you can't be a hammer nail surgeon. You've got to really, everybody's an individual, and, and that's really true in this maybe more than anything else we treat. So you've got to have options from the front, from the side, from the back. You've got to be able to do minimally invasive. You've got to be critical where you go and preserve structures when you can. It's not, a, it's, it's not the algorithm surgery. You know, it's really each individual and have a lot of tools. Yeah, so you know, there's, we all face those patients that we think need that bigger, that larger surgery. They're sagittally imbalanced. Um, let's say they even have, let's say that now we're like a 35 degree curve or even a 30 degree curve, but they are, they have kyphosis in their lumbar spine. And uh, are, how many patients do you counsel that you just don't think that surgery is going to work for them? I mean, saying no to some of these patients and they may not be healthy. Is there, what are those main things that you look at, Mike, to say, gosh, I just don't think this is going to go well or they should really have that type of surgery? And what options do you offer them? So, Mike, you bring up a really good point. We all have heard the lectures about sagittal balance and the parameters. Uh, and, of course, those parameters seem to be changing, right, as we get more evidence. And is it really appropriate to apply those in every single patient in every age group? I would say that we all understand that those surgeries are going to be the bigger, more complicated, more risky surgeries. So those patients have to come back again and again with their families, with their kids and their in-laws and all that. And, um, you know, we try to, to be sure that the symptoms are matching true sagittal balance problems, functionally and pain-related sagittal balance. And then, you know, ultimately these people, I think they come around. They come around because nobody wants to live a life crippled, right? And, um, you know, our job is to meet their right time in their life and try to try to get them through it the best way we can. Thanks, Mike. And Charlie? So again, we're, we're talking about patients maybe with, that are maybe higher risk, and, and I know you as a physician, I'm sure you've seen them like Michael does several times. This isn't something you just say, see someone one time and say, oh, you're going to have a T10 to pelvis. But what's your thought process on, on dealing with those patients, and are there certain patients you say no to? 
Yeah, I mean, it really is at the age of informed decision making, and, and the patient makes this decision probably just about as much as I, as I do, may, maybe more. They decide, you know, what they want and what they don't. My, my job, I feel, is, is to make sure the things that are modifiable, that I don't pull the trigger early. If I can make something, if I can modify something to make the surgery go less complicated, that's my job. I, I, I've got to do that. And then after that's done, I lay out the, the risks and the benefits and we decide together really if this is something they're willing to take the risk for. And nowadays, you know, we have good intensivists, we have good hospitals. This isn't something that you do, you know, at a community place. I mean, you want to have a support system. Yeah, that's, that's but, right. you know, you brace for the storm, you tell them what's going to happen, people are informed, and, and then we make the decision together. But I, I agree with Mike, you know, I don't want somebody to be miserable if if you can make them better. And, and I think nowadays you, you, we can do things that, that we really never could before. By the same token, you know, we don't want to be reckless. Right, so so. You know, take your time, modify the things you can, make the decision together. Yeah, I agree. So I think we all agree you need a, you need a good team. You need the intensivists. You need your team of uh, uh, medicine folks to help you out. Um, but I, I agree. I think for me, um, Patients have to have a lot of support around them. Um, I think, you know, if they're isolated, I think patients have severe osteoporosis, they're thin, they're emaciated, and uh, you start getting that bad feeling. There are patients that I will say, hey, I just don't think the surgery's gonna work for you. We're all aware of the, you know, major complication rate, probably 20 to 30%. I think all of us have written papers on that, and it's true. So you, I think those, the communication at the beginning is really key. So. If I can summarize, it sounds like we're all still trying to do the smallest thing we can to get people functional. Maybe we're willing to take that we have to do another surgery later if we can get five years out of them, maybe, and what Michael was saying. But when we have to do that big surgery, it takes a lot of, lot of intensive effort on our part to be with the family, make sure everybody's on board with this, because we know that the you know, chances are they'll have some complications. So.